Dr. David Andes is uh, one of our own. He graduated Mizzou, a medical degree in 92, uh, went to uh, uh, University of Wisconsin uh, for an internal medicine residency, and then um, went on to a, a postdoctorate fellowship uh, in antimicrobial pharmacodynamics and molecular biology and mycology. Uh, then he went to Woods Hole to continue uh, his investigation with uh, uh, molecular mycology and uh, eventually returned to the University of Wisconsin where he's uh, currently associate professor and, uh, of medicine and uh, medical microimmunology. Uh, he's a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Uh, he's uh, authored uh, more than 150 articles, uh, 19 book chapters, and he is uh, editor of, serves on the editorial board of 10 uh, journals focused on infectious disease. Thank you so much for returning to give us a talk. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction uh, and for the organizers for the chance to come back and uh, visit with uh, uh, family and friends and, and share a little bit uh, of you know, what, what I've been up to uh, uh, since the last time uh, I came to, to MU, and that is mycology. Um, and, and in general, my, my research interest in, within infectious disease is understanding and trying to treat and prevent uh, drug-resistant infections, again, with a primary focus on mycology. And we have three research programs uh, that attempt to uh, tackle uh, this problem. One uh, attempts to uh, understand the pharmacologic properties of drugs to optimize therapy. The second program attempts to uh, look for clinical scenarios to uh, translate that to. And then uh, more recently, uh, work to try, more, more mechanistic work to define resistance mechanisms and try and identify uh, new drug targets. And I'm going to tell three uh, brief stories uh, about two fungal diseases, uh, and each of these stories illustrates uh, one of these approaches. And the first disease uh, is, is one that you've heard a little bit about in the lay press recently, and that is invasive aspergillosis, one of the so far the minor uh, fungal pathogen for this, for this meningitis outbreak, but for a large immunocompromised host population, uh, this is probably uh, first or second uh, on the list as far as most common pathogens, and it certainly uh, is that associated with the highest uh, mortality. And interestingly, um, this is uh, in, a, in a large autopsy series, uh, we found what we already knew. This is a, this is a pathogen that's difficult to diagnose. In a recently published large multicenter autopsy series, invasive aspergillosis was the fourth most, fourth most common illness identified at autopsy in patients that died of unknown causes. As I mentioned, this is a particularly difficult fungal pathogen uh, to treat, but there have been a number of advances, pharmacologic advances, over the past couple of years, but these do have, as I'll show you in a bit, uh, an Achilles heel, a pharmacologic Achilles heel, and more recently we've also seen the development of resistance uh, over the last uh, five or six years. So the one approach, approach I mentioned is to try and understand the pharmacologic properties of these drugs to optimize therapy and to reduce the somnolence factor sometimes associated with discussion of pharmacology. I'll, I'll simplify this, and, and it really is to me this simple. And with a hypothesis is that there's an optimal drug exposure uh, needed for treatment efficacy, okay? And I won't take you through, again, all of the pharmacologic uh, formulas, uh, but simply show you an example where, where I spend a lot of time, and that is using preclinical models to try and optimize uh, treatments for clinical trials. And so this is an example of one of these preclinical model studies. This is an amurine model uh, uh, infected uh, with this pathogen, invasive aspergillosis. And on the x-axis here, you have drug exposure, and as you move to the right, you increase the drug exposure or the amount of drug uh, relative to a measure of potency in the pathogen, the minimum inhibitory concentration. And on the y-axis, you have outcome, okay, increasing survival associated with increasing drug exposure, and you mathematically define the drug exposure that leads to optimal efficacy. And I won't, uh, I'll just ask you to remember this number, 25 here. So that's the, the pharmacologic drug exposure associated with maximal survival in this animal infection model. So I mentioned uh, that uh, we had some pharmacologic advances in treatment of invasive aspergillosis, and that's been through the development of these advanced generation 
triazole drugs, uh, here are two of them, voriconazole and posiconazole. There's a third that will come to market within the next 18 months called isavuconazole. They're quite clever, right? So I save you uh, conazole. And I've, and I've uh, colored in yellow uh, the drug voriconazole, which has become the very first line therapy uh, for this disease state. And this data set on the left is from very early uh, uh, pharmacokinetic studies in healthy volunteers where early on the, pharma the pharmacologic Achilles heel was recognized and that's wide interpatient variability. So all of these patients received the same dose of oriconazole and you can see here that the drug concentrations in serum varied widely. Now part of why this happens is, underst is understood from very elegant pharmacogenomic studies, but there's a large amount of this that's not understood. And at the time, how to deal with this was, was very, very unclear. One of the, one of the things that pharm the pharmaceutical industry wants to avoid or likes to avoid is this label of, of therapeutic drug monitoring. They think that scares away clinicians, a, a concept that I'd never quite understood as more information to me is, is better. So we asked the question is, is, does concentration matter in patients treated with voriconazole? And so here's our first look at, at the first couple hundred of patients at our institution with invasive aspergillosis uh, that were treated with voriconazole. And we used uh, a recursive partitioning tool that allows you to identify breaks in data. And we found a really striking break in the data at a voriconazole trough concentration of right about two. So obviously you would have much rather have been in this group of patients that had a high likelihood of survival rather than this group of patients uh, with a low uh, voriconazole trough concentration and a much lower chance of in-hospital survival uh, that ended up being statistically significant despite the relatively small numbers of patients and intriguingly um, in, in a subset of these patients, they had very, very low voriconazole concentrations, and the clinician had that value available to them, increased the dose of voriconazole, and eight of those 11 that had subsequent concentrations greater than two uh, ended up surviving. So a very strong uh, relationship between concentration and effect that initially the industry uh, wanted to avoid. Uh, the, the, the community was eventually able to get a hold of the clinical trial data, and here's a compilation of voriconazole drug exposure clinical outcome data from the nine voriconazole clinical trials. And you can see a very, very nice relationship between, again, the drug exposure on the x-axis and outcome maxing out here. So this isn't trough concentration. This is trough, trough concentration relative to a measure of potency, the MIC. That's what we use. As I, if you'll remember in that, that preclinical model I showed you. And, and again, a very nice uh, relationship and maximal outcome with a trough concentration of about one or two. And interestingly, if you, if you look at the relationship between that trough concentration and the measure of potency, it ends up being that same uh, pharmacologic value of 25 that the preclinical models uh, predicted would have been the optimal exposure. So how do we deal with this in patients? How can we use this information to get it right the first time? Okay, so it's one thing to start your patient on one of these medications, check a trough concentration down the road, hope that you're in a therapeutic window um, because time is of the essence. And here's one study or one approach that gets us, I think, closer to that, and that is utilizing uh, population pharmacokinetics and simulation. So population pharmacokinetics uh, is, is different than what I showed you on that first voriconazole pharmacokinetic data set. So this is pharmacokinetics in patients that have the diseases, are patients that we're treating in the clinic and in the ICUs. And then using a tool called Monte Carlo simulation that can take pharmacokinetics from a small population of patients and simulate it in large groups, okay, taking into account variability and simulating the pharmacokinetics in, in groups of 10,000 or more. And so here's what happens if you do those sorts of simulations with voriconazole. So these first two columns here are the current recommended dosage regimen of this drug. And you can see here the likelihood of achieving um, one of these trough concentrations. And so we, we favored or found in our data set a trough concentration of two was optimal. Some have found 
subsequently trough concentrations of one. So let's let's agree to, to split the difference and say one and a half is the trough concentration we want to achieve. Here's the likelihood of achieving that trough concentration with the current oral voriconazole dosing regimen in the general population. Okay? So less than half of the time with the current regimen would we predict you would be in the therapeutic window. We can then take population pharmacokinetic studies from different dosing regimens and then identify the, trough, the, the dosing regimen that's more likely to get us there the first time. And so in this case, it's really twice the dose of voriconazole um, that gets us at least closer but still falling short probably because of this, uh, this uh, SNP in the main metabolizing enzyme that doesn't allow us to ever get to a therapeutic concentration, in which case we know we need to go to a different medication. So how is this information um, going to impact care? Um, here are, there, there's a treatment guideline from our main infectious disease society for invasive aspergillosis, and here's the current guideline. The current guideline recognized that therapeutic drug monitoring was out there, but really um, recommended it as a, as a a management tool of last resort, if you will, and, and, and suggested that if your patient's failing, you might increase the drug dose, you might undertake therapeutic drug monitoring. I think that's uh, no longer acceptable based on the, the, the data that's accumulated, and, uh, and we're anticipating uh, in, in the guidance that's going to come out uh, in the next 18 months that this, is some, this tool is going to be recommended for all patients uh, at the start of therapy, and certainly with any change in dosing regimen or change in how the patient is faring, either uh, a, a treatment failure and advance in the, in the infection or the uncommon toxicity. And lastly, although I think the, the jury is out here, um, I, I think we're going to be moving to higher than FDA recommended uh, voriconazole uh, dosing regimens. Again, this is a fairly safe drug and with half of the patients predicted to be in outside or below that therapeutic window, I think the new guidance will move us higher in the, in the dosing of oriconazole. And we're finding this is particularly important with the current uh, uh, meningitis outbreak, um, especially what you know, we know we need to get therapeutic concentrations into the central nervous system, and we know how much oriconazole penetrates into the central nervous system, and I won't show you data on, on this for that patient set, but this is a, a particularly important issue uh, in this current outbreak. So the second disease state is the disease state I spend actually most of my time on, and that's invasive candidiasis. So this is the most common invasive fungal pathogen, and depending on the series you look at, it's either the third or fourth most common nosocomial bloodstream infection, and it has the higher mortality of all nosocomial pathogens. And we've seen a continued change in the epidemiology of this. There are five common candida species, and the candida species that we see now in our ICUs is different than we saw 10 years ago, and that's different than we saw 20 years ago. Um, now less than half of all of these infections are due to the species we were used to seeing, and that's candida albicans. Much more commonly, we're seeing infection with candida glabrata. Uh, this is important because of the propensity for this organism to have intrinsic uh, resistance to our antifungals and the likelihood uh, of this organism developing resistance to the antifungals that we have available to us. So the study I'm going to um, show you um, asks this question and that is are there modifiable treatment factors for invasive candidiasis that allow us to optimize outcome in patients? And we theorized that despite the fact that, th that this is one of the most widely studied disease states. There are, there are nine randomized treatment trials, very, very large, some of them up to 1,000 patients uh, uh, with invasive candidiasis, but none of these have identified uh, the optimal therapy. And our, our hypothesis was that this was just simply due to the drug design that the FDA forces on people, and that is this non-inferiority design. And, we th and, and what we knew about these each of these trials is that they were performed by the same study groups and thus designed very similarly, looking at similar diagnostic definitions, outcome, timing of outcome. The data sets were very similar. And we theorized that if we could get the raw patient data, pull that data and perform analysis, that we might be able to tease out some treatment strategies that 
um, portend a favorable prognosis in our patients. So we were able to get um, from the data owners the raw data from seven of these randomized treatment trials, almost 2,000 patients. So we had patient and disease data. We had treatment data, so we knew the drug they received, the duration they received the drug, the dose of drug they received, and we also knew what happened uh, with their vascular catheters, which is important, uh, as, I'll, as I'll discuss in a, minute, in a minute. And we had three outcomes that were the same across all of these treatment trials. And so here's, here's a little bit of that data. So the great majority of these patients had a central venous catheter, which as I'll show you in a little bit, and especially in the third part of my talk, uh, is important as uh, a site of persistent infection. Here's the severity of illness. Here's the species breakdown again, uh, similar to what we're seeing contemporarily, uh, less than half of these patients having infection with Candida albicans. A quarter of them, of them received amphotericin B, a quarter of triazole, and almost half of them are newest uh, class of antifungal agents for treatment of invasive candidiasis and iconocandin uh, antifungal. So we performed univariate and subsequently multivariate analysis on this data set, and here is the final model for the aggregate data set. So this included all candida species. And you know, some of the data was not surprising at all. So advancing age and severity of illness and the immunocompromised state uh, was associated with increased risk of 30-day mortality. And, but two of the treatment factors ended up being important. So first, the choice of drug. Receiving uh, an anti iconocandin antifungal drug portended a favorable prognosis uh, compared to receiving a triazole or a polyene antifungal. And removing a central venous catheter almost doubled your chance of survival uh, in this patient population. Importantly, we forced into the model each of these different seven studies, and that did not have an impact uh, on outcome in the multivariate model. So here's what the drug treatment data looks like uh, graphically. So here's mortality if you received an iconocandin compared to the triazole and amphotericin B, a statistically significant difference, increasing the risk of survival by more than 10%. Here's the data for the vascular catheter management. So you remove a catheter, you're more likely to survive than if you retain the catheter. Um, we see the same uh, statistical significance and the same factors fitting into these models, whether we use mortality or clinical success or microbiologic success. We did a number of subgroup analyses, and, and I'll show you just one. That is the subgroup of patients uh, that are infected with this candida species that we see as the emerging candida species and the candida species that we have the greatest problem with resistance, candida glabrata. Here again, Apache 2 was very important, but both drug class and catheter management uh, remained in the final models. So I, I do think um, that this uh, trial is going to have an impact, albeit subtle, uh, on the treatment guidelines. I can say that with some confidence since I'm on the writing committee. Um, <laughs> however, as were a number of my co-authors. So the current guideline favors an iconocandin, but really considers this a safe class of antifungals uh, to save for your patients that are most severely ill and infected with candida species uh, that are less susceptible to the triazole uh, drug class. How I think that's going to be changed is that I think the iconocannons are going to be recommended as a first-line therapy for all patients, uh, regardless of infecting species and regardless of severity of illness. We did an interaction study uh, that I've not shown you that looked at the interaction between Apache 2 score and each of these treatment variables. And until you reach a, a, an Apache 2 quartile or an Apache 2 score greater than 34, it made a difference. So even in the, very, very, even in the patients with very, very low Apache 2 scores, mild illness, so Apache 2 scores of 10 or 11, they still had a significant improvement in mortality or in survival. Uh, uh, when they received an iconocannon. The same was true for the intravenous catheter management, and this has been hotly debated for a couple of decades, and, and I can understand the rationale for the two sides, but I think 
that despite the fact that this wasn't a randomized treatment uh, in these trials, um, I think this is going to go from a should to a strongly uh, recommend uh, with, a, with an upgrade in, in, the, in the quality of the recommendation. So the last uh, program I'm going to talk about really deals with the, the lifestyle of disease that these organisms uh, uh, live in uh, when they're growing on these medical devices like the central venous catheters, and that is in the biofilm state uh, that's in the background of this slide. So this is a, a Canada Albicans biofilm that's two or 300 microns thick that's on the luminal surface uh, of a central venous catheter. And biofilm formation is a, really a universal attribute of, of all bacteria and fungi, uh, some parasites as well. A biofilm is simply a microbial community in which the organisms grow attached to each other and to some other substrate. And they produce and become enmeshed in a material that's, that's called the extracellular matrix. Okay? When the cells grow in biofilms, as opposed to growing free-floating or planktonically, they behave phenotypically different. And perhaps the most important phenotypic characteristic of biofilm growth is resistance to uh, anti-infective drugs and to the immune system. So I think over the last couple of decades, this has been recognized as increasingly important. If you were to do a PubMed search 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you might find 100 or 200 articles on biofilms. Now you find 20,000 articles on biofilms. And the NIH uh, has recognized this as an increasingly common form of human infection. And here are some of the, the common or well-recognized biofilm infection states. And those that I'm most interested in are in the nosocomial setting for device-related infections. This is particularly important for Canada. So here's data from our National Nosocomial Infection Surveillance data set that tells us that 50% of all hospital infections are associated with the medical device. You can see here we place a lot of medical devices in our patients. And for Canada, bloodstream infections, up to 70% are associated with a biofilm on a central venous catheter, as illustrated by this confocal micrograph. So here's what happens when you expose uh, biofilms growing on a catheter uh, uh, to antifungals. So this is in, from an animal model that we've developed in which we, we surgically implant uh, central venous catheters in rats. And so here's the burden of organisms on those catheters uh, when we expose it to antifungal drug. Drugs from two different classes are simply saline. And you can see here that, that despite the fact that we're exposing these biofilms to concentrations that are a thousand times greater than that that would be needed in a test tube, an MIC plate, to kill the organisms, the organisms grow happily. Just really no difference between saline controls and drug treatment. So, so really a big problem. Now we've learned a lot um, across uh, microbes about biofilm formation and where we might interject to reduce this drug resistance. So we know that these organisms need to initially adhere to a substrate and then we get cellular accumulation. We get the production of that extracellular matrix that I mentioned. There are signaling molecules that tell the cells to grow or not grow, produce matrix, do not produce matrix. And then there are signals that tell the organisms to disperse which is really the, the part of the disease state that ends up killing our patients in this disseminated disease. So there are a number of, of uh, really innovative projects attempting to develop therapeutics to block each of these steps. Our lab is concentrated on the matrix, the organism-derived extracellular matrix, which is pseudocolored purple in this uh, high magnification electron micrograph of one of our candida biofilms. So this is a, a very abundant material. And what we found is that this material acts like a sponge to sequester the anti-infective drugs. So here's an example of a study that demonstrates that. So what we've done is taken advantage of our ability to radio label one of the antifungals, in this case fluconazole, and we expose the biofilms in their intact state to fluconazole. And you can see here, here's the, here's the total radioactivity. And then we measure the radioactivity in the different portions of this intact biofilm. And what we find is 
none of the radioactivity gets inside the cells. All of it is retained in this extracellular matrix. We've been able to isolate this extracellular matrix and perform NMR where we can measure the protons on this drug fluconazole and look what happens to, looks what, look what happens to these protons as we add increasing concentrations of the extracellular matrix. And what you can see here is you, you completely damp out that proton and we see this with actually the entire molecule is just completely consumed uh, by this extracellular matrix. So, you know, we thought, well, that's intriguing, but what, what explains um, this phenotype, this phenomena? Our first uh, approach to answer that was to try and define what this extracellular matrix is made of. It's made up predominantly of, of complex polysaccharides, and we've identified three polysaccharides in the matrix, the most abundant being uh, a complex mannan, and then there are two different uh, glucan uh, structures in the matrix. And so here's a confocal micrograph showing a large amount of this mannan material in the extracellular matrix. We've then tried to identify uh, the genetic components uh, that are important for production of this extracellular matrix uh, in an attempt to identify potential drug targets uh, for new therapeutics. And to do that, we used uh, microarrays from our in vivo catheter model, and we looked for uh, genes that were upregulated during growth and that based on gene function would have a, a putative function for production or modification of one of these three polysaccharides. And I'm going to just show you an example uh, of one of those uh, genes and, and gene products, and that is uh, the, uh, data from the gene FKS1. So this is a gene that encodes the primary glucan synthase in this uh, Canada species. And so what we do then is we, uh, we delete uh, this gene from the organism. And we also, in a subsequent study, uh, place the gene under a very strong promoter so that we can overexpress uh, that gene. And then we look at what happens to the matrix. So here is on the y-axis the amount, increasing amount, of one of those polysaccharides in the matrix. This is beta-1,3-glucan. And so WT is wild type, so we see quite a bit of this material in the matrix and the reference strain. When we uh, uh, perform a deletion of one allele of this gene, we have the amount of glucan in the matrix and interestingly um, increase it by twofold uh, in the overexpression strain. What does this do to that drug sequestration phenotype? So that's this data over here on the right. So again, this is the treated fluconazole that is retained in the matrix. I'm not showing you any of the, the intracellular uh, data because again, trust me, none of the, cell, none of the drug uh, gets into uh, the cytoplasm. Here's our wild type strain. We see much less sequestration uh, in, in the mutant and an increase in sequestration in our overexpression strain. Here's what you see uh, qualitatively on our high mag scanning electron micrograph. So this structure in the back is the candida and all of this fibrinous material on the top is the extracellular matrix that you see largely uh, disappear uh, in, in the deletion mutant, but uh, an abundance of that extracellular matrix in the strain in which this gene is, is overproduced. Well, that's great, but what does this mean for treatment of patients? So um, here is the impact I showed you before that regardless of how much drug we uh, expose these biofilms to, uh, they grew happily. Well, here's what happens uh, in our mutant. So here's uh, our mutant receiving saline, it grows very well. Here's our wild type strain receiving saline and our antifungal drug doesn't make a difference. But we're able to, to eliminate a large amount of the biofilm growth uh, in our mutant uh, with relatively low concentrations of this drug fluconazole, albeit not, not as low of concentrations as we would like. This is just uh, an, another example of how we might target this extracellular matrix, and that is by exposing the uh, biofilms to a hydrolyzing enzyme that degrades, in this case, uh, beta-1,3-glucan. And you can see here, we can take this biofilm from fluconazole resistant to fluconazole susceptible by adding in this hydrolyzing enzyme. So thus far, 
um, we've identified um, eight uh, drug targets or eight genes, or eight enzymes uh, that are uh, responsible for the production of three of these matrix polysaccharides and been able to show that when we delete uh, these enzymes, we reduce the amount of this extracellular matrix and the result is a biofilm that is susceptible to each of the three antifungal drug classes uh, that we have available. Here's our current working model that is busy and perhaps I, I'm the only one who uh, will understand this, but uh, so basically this is the, this is the, everything on to the left of here is the fungal cell, okay, and everything to the right is the extracellular matrix. And in data I'm not showing you, um, uh, what we found is that these three extracellular matrix polysaccharides interact with each other in a cooperative fashion to sequester these little yellow dots, which are the antifungals, and that when you disrupt any of these genes, either genetically or, as I'll show you in a bit, pharmacologically, we can remove this extracellular matrix, allowing the drug to uh, reach uh, its intracellular target. So that's where we're at now. Um, we've identified a series of primary and secondary screens that we're now beginning to utilize uh, for high throughput screens with the help of our small molecule uh, screening facility where we can screen uh, compound libraries more than, you know, libraries of more than 100,000 small molecules to attempt to identify uh, compounds that uh, eliminate this extracellular matrix uh, and return these cells to susceptible uh, as they would be in the planktonic state. And I'll end and uh, again, thank you very, very much uh, for the chance to come back and, and visit with friends and share a little bit about what we've been up to and also like to acknowledge the folks that really that do all of, the, all of this work. Thank you very much, Dr. Andes. Uh, you have time for a few questions. had an opportunity to visit the nanotechnology facility at Purdue University a couple of months ago. Is there any place for that type of uh, approach in the treatment of these uh, really troubling fungal infections? So I guess there's a couple of ways that I've seen people try to use nanotechnology to tackle the biofilm problem. One is, is to um, complex molecules um, using nanotechnology to avoid sequestration by the, ma the matrix. I've not seen that be successful yet, but I think that's one way to apply that technology. The other is um, use of nanotechnology to try and uh, alter the surfaces of these uh, devices uh, so that they're no longer susceptible or perhaps less susceptible to, to biofilm formation. Um, I know there's a lot of money going into that ladder um, I worry a little bit about that because unless you can uh, reduce adsorption of host, you know, mammalian uh, matricellular proteins like fibrinogen and fibrinectin, um, soon after a device is placed, it takes on the characteristics of fibrinogen and fibrinectin. So, but that is a, a very intense area, an interesting area of study. Uh, David, uh, is there uh, two questions? Is there any experience with echinocandins in pediatrics, and do you know about the effectiveness in the peritoneum in case of peritoneal dialysis? Since this is a, a common organism we see in patients who've had multiple antibiotic treatments uh, and develop peritonitis, and that can pretty well wipe out the peritoneum, as you know. So there is quite a bit of pediatric experience with each of these antifungals. That certainly. Um, was something that uh, took a while to get, but we do now have that. Um, the iconocandins um, are effective uh, in treatment of intra-abdominal infections. I've not seen any specific studies on treatment of uh, peritoneal dialysis associated, you know, candida uh, peritoneal dialysis infections, where again, what I, what I worry is about these uh, biofilms on, on the peritoneal device itself, but the drug does penetrate well into uh, the peritoneum and works very well for intra-abdominal candidiasis. Uh, Dave, uh, excellent talk. You've done our class proud. Uh, two questions. One, specifically on the biofilm production. Uh, 
Is the polysaccharide uh, sequestered from the plasma or from the body, or is it made simply by the, the candida? It, so in this case, the, the material that I've shown you is made entirely by uh, the, the organism. Um, we do have a, a different research program uh, where we look at host contribution to the matrix. So, um, so your point is well taken. What I show you, especially from these in vivo biofilms, is not all organism derived. We know that there's, for example, fibrinogen and fibronectin and vitronectin um, in these biofilms as well. But the polysaccharides that I've shown you are, are all organism derived. And so on the line of the fibronectin, exchanging a catheter will probably leave a, a level of fibrin behind. Will you, would you break that up or do you just believe in removing the line completely and not, not exchanging? So I would remove the line. I wouldn't exchange at the same site for certain because I think, I think there's enough data to suggest that the likelihood of reinfection with an exchange is too high. Steve, yeah. As there is a contribution of the biofilm, is there potentially be benefit flushing those, those catheters empirically with the hydrolysis? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that probably helps for the, the luminal surface of these devices, um, but unfortunately um, doesn't help us with the extra luminal side. But yeah, definitely. Keeping these things patent and free of adsorbed host matricellular proteins is, I think, helpful. Yes? Do you think these have anything to do with the increase we're seeing in plot formation of the line? Definitely. I do. I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. I mean, we, we've done some reconstruction experiments where in ex vivo where we add in microbe and different host matricellular proteins alone and in combination and it's amazing uh, the synergy uh, you see between just a few microbes and these matricellular proteins and thus clotting.